All right, we're ready, Kevin. All right, very good. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you taking your time for this meeting of the City of Charleston Health and Wellness Advisory Committee for Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. Um, I was very excited to hear that many of you um, have committed to continue to be on this committee, and uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your time and your willingness to uh, to serve and to, to help the city of Charleston in our area, you know, with health and wellness and, uh, and to share your expertise. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. I did want to uh, mention that um, we have a couple people who send their apologies that they had conflicts this morning. Uh, Susan Johnson, Maggie Dangerfield, um, and Lisa Burbage all um, said to please apologize that they weren't able to make it, but they did have some conflicts. And uh, we do have uh, Stacy Mathis is going to be filling in for uh, Jennifer Brush this morning. So we appreciate Stacy being on as well. So thank you so much. Um, Paul had sent out the minutes, I think last Friday. Um, if I could get a motion to approve those minutes, please. Oh, Paul, sorry. With, with one cor correction, Mike Seekings was at that meeting and I had him not at the meeting, but I, that's only correction. Okay, great. Um, can I get a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting, please? Uh, this is Carolyn Murray. I make a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Thank you, Carolyn. We got a motion to approve, and I'll second. Um, any discussion on that? All in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes have been approved. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll move on. Um, let's see. Dr. Richardson is not on, is she? Paul, do you have her? She's not yet, but she is going to be on. So we can. Um... All right. Why don't we go down to community updates and then we'll come back to that. Okay, great. We'll move on to community updates. And um, Joey, anything from you on our community updates, Joey Current? Uh, nothing from United Way at this time. Although um, I do want to mention that for those folks out there who um, know about our 211 uh, helpline, um, it's a it's a call line that we staff a, a center with folks who can answer the phone 24-7, 365 days a year um, for folks who are um, looking for resources in their community um, to address kind of um, any kind of financial burdens or, or other social services they need. That call center is, um, is available, and I always want to remind folks that they can um, absolutely um, encourage folks that they work with in the community to use that line. Um, we are getting a texting uh, version uh, coming out here soon, so we are going to uh, have the ability for folks to be able to text things like um, uh, the word food or housing or um, whatever um, need they may have to our 211 uh, line, and they will be directed to um, the resources that are near them. Um, so that's a it's an exciting uh, thing that we are we are rolling out here in the next couple of months. Great. Well, thank you, Joey. We need to try to see what we can do to help get that 211 uh, information out there to people. Any any suggestions on how we can help get that out? Um, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, we we have we have folks who um, it's it's their one of their responsibilities to go around and make sure that we spread the the word about that program. We have lots of flyers, lots of cards, and lots of information that we can um, get uh, passed out to folks. So, if there's anybody that's on this. Um, committee today would like to have some of that information at their organization. Um, I'm happy to connect with you and get you. Um, we have nice cards. We have flyers and all kinds of um, great uh, pictures. Great. All right. Thank you so, so much. Joey, if you've got something you could send to the city, we've got that newsletter that goes out weekly, and I'd be glad to, to put, I had planned on doing something. I was going to ask you today for it, that I could put out there for it. Uh, Joey, um, yeah, if you've got any cards that you want to send over to us at the Low Country Food Bank, more than happy to put them out and also share them out with our partner agencies as well um, across the uh, across the county. Happy to do it. Very good. OK, um, Paul, I wonder if that's something I don't know if that's something we could have in our our fire departments or our, our public safety areas, you know, people that respond out. It's just an idea. I, you know, I, I thought I'd throw that to you Paul and see see what your thoughts are there absolutely um whatever you can get to me Joey I will 
reach out to both of those and see what kind of material we could share with them to, to do it. And maybe it'd be a good little short brief. We could just tell them about also where all those resources are so that they could reach out to them and um, try to take advantage of it all. So. All right. Well, thank you for that, Joey. Appreciate that. Um, Stacy, did Stacy Mathis, did you have anything that you wanted to update us on? Sure, I could tell you a few things. We have a lot going on right now. Um, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So we're out in the community doing lots of different programs at schools. Um, I was out this past Saturday at an event. So we're trying to uh, kind of share the word about mental health, um, mental wellness, those sorts of things. So we'll be out in the communities a lot. Um, on top of that, we, on uh, as part of the Piccolo Spoleto Visual Arts Program, we do an art show every year. Um, it's open this year to students in Charleston County Schools, uh, fourth grade through 12th grade. Um, and it's down at the Circular Congregational Church. So it's um, just sort of a way that kids can express themselves, their triumphs, their struggles through um, whatever art medium sort of floats their their boat so we're excited about that this will be our third year I think doing it um, just with kids in uh, in schools so that's exciting um, we are still um, looking for a vista if anybody happens to know we have a vista through the city um, so we have uh, we're sort of patiently looking for somebody, but that person's job is going to focus on health and wellness, um, not just for our patients, but our, for our staff as well. Um, I don't know if Jennifer's talked with y'all about that, but we've, we're really looking at ways that we can help take care of our staff so that we don't have quite so much turnover so that we can provide better care for our patients. Um, you know, having a lot of turnover in staff makes it hard on on folks to, you know, to attend appointments and to come and to feel comfortable with that. So we've been trying for that for about a year and a half now. We're, uh, fingers crossed, this one, we will get get someone this cycle. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Any questions on that, Paul? Stacey, while we're in you know, the Attorney General's um, proclamation yesterday or a reach out about loneliness and all, have, have y'all read on that or have, does our mental health have any are y'all going to be doing anything on a promotion with that at all? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I, I can look into the article. I just, I wasn't aware that that came out. He, he just oh. made it, as, it. He said he compared it to a person loneliness. He compared to a person smoking 10 packs of cigarettes a day of having as much damage done. And um, so it was a pretty big article. And I just think it, while it's out there, we ought to be in our community, at least us, from our side of helping to push that message. I think Dr. Richardson has a comment on that. So. And that's actually one of the articles I'm going to cover um, today. Right. So we're on the same page, Paul. That's, Very good. And honestly, we, um, we've we seen that. We are trying to get our patients to move away from the telehealth platforms when they can to coming into our offices um, because we've seen that isolation increase. We've seen folks that are um, you know, struggling with depression and anxiety, choosing the telehealth platforms, overcoming it. And we just are really feeling like we have got to get face to face and encouraging folks to um, to come in and see their their people and encouraging our folks to go out and do home visits and that sort of thing. Because, you know, you do lose something um, with that telehealth platform. So we we do see that as well. Thank you very much, Stacy. Appreciate that. Uh, Nick, anything? You want to report out? Um, nothing really from my side. Oh, just to encourage um, to, if anyone um, wants to share information with where to find food, just to direct people to our website, the lowcountryfoodbank.org, uh, and on the Find Food tab, um, there's a very easy to use, interactive um, way of being able to identify the nearest food pantries. Um, and also the other food distributions that are going on in and around um, areas. So just encouraging people to, to use that on our website. As I said, it's an easy, um, easy process. You can either use it. It works very well on, on a smartphone as well. So it, it's designed in a way that can be easily accessible on a smartphone uh, on that website as well. So just encouraging people to use that fine food uh, facility on our, on our website. Great. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, I know that there's not a 
camera on, but I see Aretha from Fetter. Uh, anything you wanted to report out from Fetter? I will say good morning and just remember that we still have some of the COVID vaccines. Uh, we have some tests left and some masks. So if you're traveling and you need to stop by to get some free masks, please stop by and get some. Um, as the emergency funding um, ends, we will, as a community health center, continue to get products until the stock um, at the federal levels run out. So we will have some items if individuals are needing tests or vaccines or masks. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, and uh, Kimbo, I know you don't have Kimbo Yee from the Citadel. I know you don't have your camera on, but I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to share with us from the Citadel. Uh, no, I don't have anything major. Um, this month is uh, National Physical Fitness and Sports Month. So, uh, you know, what better time to get the summer started than celebrating and promoting physical activity and uh, the benefit of sports participation. So, uh, you know, good messages spread around as we enter the summer. Um, I know the Department of Health and Human Services will be coming up with different infographics and blogs throughout the month to celebrate that. So, Paul, as they come out, maybe I'll send them to you to send out to the committee so people can share that. Um, other than that, busy weekend in Charleston, Citadel, CFC, as well as uh, Charleston Sun will all be having their commencement. So expect downtown and Charleston in general will be quite busy. Very good. Thank you so much. All right. Did I miss anybody on community updates? Anyone that anyone else that needed to report out or, or share anything with us? Well, thank you uh, so much for uh, for all of that. We will move on to our community health update with Dr. Katie Richardson, if you would, please. Of course. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to first uh, talk about a meeting that was held on Friday, April 21st, where Mayor Tecklenburg recommitted um, Charleston to being a fast track city for ending the HIV epidemic. Um, this was an intra-jurisdictional meeting, the first um, in South Carolina, and brought together um, folks around ending the epidemics, um, which is a, a South Carolina effort um, focused on HIV, but also what we call syndemics of substance use disorder um, and other sexually transmitted infections. And there are two fast track cities in South Carolina, Columbia and Charleston. Um, and so we met together for a full day um, in, uh, in Charleston here at the health department. Um, and we are looking forward to working more closely with Columbia um, and for me to bring back to this committee um, some specific um, recommendations um, that um, we began to discuss um, at that meeting. So that will be coming sometime soon. Um, I, I know um, Aretha mentioned um, the end of the um, COVID um, emergency, and that is happening next week, um, May the 11th. Um, and we've been hearing um, several changes, including some um, that Aretha brought up, including um, that uh, test um, for those with um, private insurance uh, will no longer be available monthly through the federal government. Um, there may be some cost sharing with uh, COVID um, vaccines, as well as testing at health providers' offices. Um, but thankfully, um, our federally qualified community health centers, such as FEDER, as well as our um, health departments um, and others will continue to have um, tests that can be picked up for free um, while supplies last. And um, the health department, as far as we know, will continue to offer um, vaccine um, free of charge. Um, we will begin once our Pfizer vaccine runs out to be offering Moderna only. Um, we've already stopped offering the uh, Novavax. That does not mean that there's no availability in the community, um, but from the, um, from the health department, um, that will be the case. And then um, finally, the federal mandates around COVID vaccination um, 
um, for certain groups, including federal employees um, and international travelers um, will also uh, end uh, on that day. And that's really because, um, thankfully, since, um, since January of 2021, when vaccines started to become available, COVID deaths in the U.S. have declined by 95% and hospitalizations down almost 91%. Um, this has been mirrored um, by um, other countries um, around the world. Uh, that being said, we will still be recommending um, COVID vaccines because they do continue to reduce hospitalizations um, and deaths. Um, we're expecting a new formulation um, to come out in the fall. Um, and at least at this point, are expecting that, that a yearly booster um, will be the recommendation. Um, but in the past uh, month, um, the CDC did say for those who are interested, um, especially those who are immune compromised or age 65 and over, um, that another booster um, is possible now. There was not a recommendation for those two groups to automatically uh, get another booster, um, but it is an option um, at this point in time. And certainly those who have not gotten a bivalent booster, um, that continues to be um, the recommendation. Um, I wonder, the newspaper today had a um, front page uh, article on um, Charleston County's plans to use the opioid settlement um, money. So if you haven't seen that article, I definitely recommend that you um, go um, and look it up. Um, Charleston County received about $900,000. Um, and um, that is uh, part of what is a $26 billion settlement with three pharmaceutical companies um, around um, their promotion of, uh, of opioids really as being non-addictive um, when that um, indeed was not the case. All 46 counties in South Carolina are receiving uh, funds as well as 43 eligible municipalities. And those uh, include um, the city of Charleston um, as well as Mount Pleasant and several others um, in our tri-county um, area. So um, some of the things that the article talked about um, was started off with a very alarming statistic that drug overdose deaths in South Carolina increased by more than 25% in 2021 um, alone. Um, and that opioids continue to be the primary killer in overdoses, especially um, fentanyl. Uh, so some of the things that, um, that the article mentions um, that will be receiving funding are Charleston Center to hire more team members to expand services like detox and residential treatment programs. The coroner's office uh, will get money to continue testing uh, victims to determine how many deaths are associated with opioids, especially um, fentanyl. Um, community partners will come together in the early fall for nearly two days of intensive workshopping to create a countywide needs assessment and strategic plan. And I certainly uh, hope that, that some on this committee will be involved um, in that uh, process. Um, there will be um, money set aside for building a comprehensive data tool, sort of a dashboard uh, to look at Charleston County uh, data around um, overdoses. And then um, also whether harm reduction strategies are working and, and money will be uh, set aside for a Narcan saturation plan, which is really um, a name for just trying to get Narcan um, out in the community uh, such that those um, who um, could benefit um, from, um, from its use, um, it is available um, and is, is used to, uh, to save lives. Fentanyl test strips um, are also part of that plan. So police officers, paramedics, and coroners um, can all leave behind free Narcan kits at scenes where um, they meet anyone at risk um, for overdosing. They can also provide education um, on uh, signs of overdose and how to use uh, Narcan. Um, and, um, and the Narcan will also be um, given to area schools. So they're, um, Charleston Center is working with Charleston County School District um, to um, provide Narcan in all schools. And uh, at least the thought now is that it will be positioned in some way by the AED machines, um, which are used um, when people um, may be in arrhythmias um, causing uh, cardiac arrest. Um, but that's still being uh, worked out. Um, 
there was a study that um, was discussed here in the article that said that 40% of school nurses in North Carolina and South Carolina encountered a student with an opioid prescription, um, but only 4% had access to naloxone um, at that point in time. And still currently in our school, school nurses do not have access to naloxone, although so the, um, the school resource officers um, do. And, um, and obviously the school is doing other, uh, has other substance uh, use prevention um, tactics. And maybe we can hear more about those from Maggie um, when she is uh, next on this call. So um, again, I just encourage you to, um, to uh, check out this article and to um, reach out to Shonda Funsell um, and others about that uh, two-day strategic plan because this is really a probably a once-in-a-lifetime um, you know opportunity um, with this kind of money flowing into our um, local municipalities, county, and state um, to really um, make a difference in uh, substance use disorder and opioid overdoses. Um, and then I wanted to finish um, by uh, talking about the article. Um, we're talking about the um, the. Uh, Surgeon General, um, who did uh, come out with an 81-page report um, talking about loneliness and the health the risk, um, and um, and Paul uh, is correct that um, let me see where the statistics is that was talking about. Yeah, widespread loneliness in the U.S. poses health risk as deadly as smoking a dozen cigarettes daily. Um, it costs the health industry billions of dollars annually. Um, and we know this started um, even a couple of decades before COVID, um, where Americans became less engaged with um, their worship houses, with community organizations, and even their own family members. Um, but that crisis uh, deepened um, quickly during the COVID um, pandemic. Um, the loneliness epidemic really is hitting young people, especially hard, those in the 50s to 24 um, age group. And um, certainly uh, I've seen that um, in our communities and, and suspect many of you have as well. Loneliness increases the risk of premature death by nearly 30% with the report revealing that those with poor social relationships had a greater risk for stroke and heart disease. It also elevates a person's likelihood for experiencing depression, anxiety, and, um, and dementia. So the Surgeon General is really calling for uh, workplaces, schools, technology companies, community organizations, parents, and other people to make changes that will boost our communities, um, our country's um, connectedness. Um, that's um, in part by um, joining community groups and uh, putting down our phones when catching up with friends, um, employees to think carefully about their remote work policies, and health systems to provide training for doctors to recognize the health risk of, um, of loneliness. Um, and he cited a final study that said the people who use social media for two or more hours daily were more than twice as likely to report feeling socially isolated um, that, as those um, who were on such apps for less than 30 minutes a day. Um, so that's obviously a huge issue um, and um, lots, of, um, lots of implications uh, for addressing it, uh, but that I believe is, um, is an issue of public health importance um, that I uh, am glad that the Surgeon General is, uh, is bringing to the forefront. Um, and um, that's what I've got for today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. I appreciate that information on the, it's a, it's a lot to think about on the, on the loneliness side and also exciting to have the resources that we have and some of the plans that you talked about as well. So any questions for Dr. Richardson? All right. Well, um, if not, um, want to, we want to look at our, uh, community health needs assessment for, uh, 2022 review. Um, and, uh, as Paul sent out a, an email last week, we kind of want to identify our six highest priorities in our communities and try to get that to our city of Charleston department heads and, and to city council, see what we can do to, uh, move the needle on our life expectancy. So um, I'm gonna call on Paul to kind of start us off with that conversation, if you would, please. Well, I just wanted to open the, the question to, to see, to, I feel like the, from the Health and Wellness Advisory Committee, 
we were presented this information and I felt like we, maybe the city is waiting for, or the community is waiting to hear some recommendations of what we can do in the city around these areas. And if you remember, they were access to, to care, um, clinical preventative services, behavioral health, obesity, nutrition, and physical activity, maternal, infant, and child health. Um, those were actually the top five. They added in, um, they took oral health and moved it into clinical services. And I think they took, um, took one other one and added it into access to health care. But the, the, whole, the whole process is, is that the, you know, in our community, we know that um, that we've got a lot of pocket areas that, that don't that we've got low life expect or not low life. But we've got life life expectancy that's lower than some of our other communities, and so those those items have always been important to us to keep focused on. And here now we've got this report again that is for the last um, 2016, 2019, 2022 now that still lists these five items as our primary areas. And I just thought like maybe it, it, it's time that, that we, we listen to each other and just try to start talking about what are strategies that we could, could send forth to the city and to city council um, that would, would maybe help us start to move some needles here. And, and and even starting on the access to health care, uh, Joey and I had a brief little conversation and, and earlier back um, two years ago when we were doing the city plan, we had that conversation or last year, we had that conversation with our, our city planning staff about the ways that transportation and other, other things that we do in our community are need to be part of, of plans because they're the driving force to how we start to address some of these items. So I really just wanted to start that conversation out there and just see where it might go as to what your feelings are, how are things that we can use that we can focus or that, that we as a city should be able to bring to the table to help focus on how we move the needle in our community on some of these items. I know Joey's ready to say something. Thanks, Paul. I mean, I think um, I think that there's a lot of ways that this group can provide recommendations to the city. Um, I think that there are kind of a couple different ways that um, we have found success in trying to address some of these health needs. Certainly just understanding which partners in, in our community are trying to address these needs on their own. Many of those folks are, you know, even on this committee. Um, and so, you know, like we always do whenever we have folks present, uh, we always ask, is there anything that we can do? Um, what can the city do to help support you? Um, so continuing to do that. Um, but there, there are some, uh, you know, certainly some policies and some um, and some recommendations that other um, cities have put forth uh, that we could look to to see if there's anything that we can um, that we can do as well to address some of these things. Paul, you mentioned access to health healthcare, and the two biggest um, barriers that we see time and time again is as access to health insurance, which is an affordability issue, but then the transportation piece is also really important. Um, I'm not sure if there has been a comprehensive look at the transportation options for folks to get to healthcare settings throughout the city of Charleston. And I think there are, are lots of different ways and we hope that folks are utilizing, um, you know, the different public transportation options, but um, that could be something that we could, we could look into and see if there are gaps or maybe an expanded um, access for folks in that area. Um, just, just, uh, just, to go off of kind of that first one, but I think we could do the same thing with, with each of these health topics. So that's, those are my thoughts, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Um, you know, um, we can certainly um, take a look, especially at, at transportation. Of course, 
Councilman Seekings is on here. When you think transportation, you think Councilman Seekings all the time because he's he's the transportation guru. But yeah, any gaps we can fill and that kind of thing. But uh, Councilman Seekings, you have any anything that you wanted to share on that? I do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member. And I'm sorry I'm not turned on. I'm actually driving around. So uh, I think at the next meeting, perhaps it would be good for me and I'll get someone from CARTA to give you all a little um, briefing on what we're doing at CARTA in terms of access to healthcare in Charleston County. We have a program where we're partnering with Uber and Lyft that allows um, people in the county to use those services and the, the, the bulk of the cost of doing so is underwritten by CARTA. The, the cap on the fee is $4. And then it goes, we pay up to 30. We're about to expand that, I think, to $45 for a ride um, at our next board meeting, which is next week. So um, if you don't mind, Paul, or someone put me on the agenda for next meeting, and I'll give everyone a complete update on what options there are for people to get access to health care in a very convenient and economical way in and around Charleston County. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Happy to do it. And there'll be some more options coming too as we sort of expand service and look at low country rapid transit and the reconfigurate, reconfiguring of our entire business model. So um, very much um, at the core and heart of what we're thinking about is access to food and to health care for people who otherwise have challenges getting there. So um more to come on all that, and I, I agree with that being a priority. So thanks for bringing it up. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Sure. All right. I think Nick spoke earlier and made a good point of, of it's the low country or lcfb.org of making sure that that is available. I, I know a lot of your, you do so much community outreach and you have places all around the community. Um, you know, one of the conversations keeps coming up about food deserts, but other than the, the, the 29405 zip code, I, and we know we have spotted some in, in West Ashley, but it seems to me like y'all have been addressing or, or, or in those locations and all, but is there more we can do with nutrition side, Nick? Sorry, Paul, what was the last part of your, you said that, sorry? I said, is there any more we could do with nutrition on the, um, the, the, one of the, the, you know, I was listening to the um, DHEC did a report at the, uh, for Charlie United Way did a uh, racial um, diversity workshop a couple of weeks ago. And, and they've talked about not enough adults are eating fruits and, and a low percentage of children are eating, um, getting their, their percentages up. And I, I just wonder what, what can we do more with all that y'all are doing? Um, and same thing to Katie, what, what can we do more to try to really push out their healthy nutrition habits and in, into our community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, from, from from the Low Country Food Bank perspective, I mean, we have quite a significant program that focuses on nutrition um, in a number of different ways. I, I mean, not just least in terms of how we're addressing food needs in communities by focusing very much on foods to encourage. So that's very much looking at food that is nutritious. I mean, focusing on proteins, produce and dairy. Um, also providing food in a way that provides um, people the opportunity to make the choices that they want to make as well, rather than being um, provided with a, a pre-packed box, for example. So providing market style opportunities. And that's all part and parcel of the strategy that we have in addressing some of the needs in some of these food deserts. Um, and we there are nutrition programs in terms of uh, nutrition training, both in terms of through schools, with libraries, um, and with our seniors as well. So, I mean, we we do have a number of nutrition-related um, um, materials, both in terms of, from a training perspective, but also in terms of uh, menus uh, and cooking options of how to use food more effectively and efficiently to be able to provide the most nutritious value um, to, to uh, individuals as well. Um, so, you know, there's a large component of what, what we're doing is, is focusing on nutrition and the importance of nutrition, but also related to the physical activity as well. 
Very good. I see Dr. Richardson has her hand up. I just also wanted to mention um, a program that uh, DHEC uh, runs um, really in conjunction with the federal government, and that is WIC, Women, Infants, and Children. That's for pregnant women as well as um, young children um, and, uh, and their families while they're young. And we've really made great strides during the COVID pandemic to make it a much more user-friendly program um, where, um, where most of the services have been um, through um, telehealth or virtual, um, which is important for young, um, young mothers. Um, and um, and it, it's a program that does provide, there's a farmer's market component um, mm -hmm. that does provide, again, I, I really think that that choice um, that Nick was talking about is important and it, it does provide uh, choices for which fruits and vegetables um, a family uh, would like to um, would like to purchase um, with their WIC benefits. So certainly any um, assistance in, uh, in helping to spread the word um, about WIC um, would be helpful. And, um, and if anyone wants more information, I can get to you personally, or we can invite someone um, from the WIC program to to speak to this committee as well all right thank you for that let's see so was going to say some, my question was going to be toward the adult population as well as with the children it seems like we have a lot of safe areas out there to do but what about the adults in our community how, how do we talk to them about more about the the eating healthy eating etc yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, there's, uh, thank you, Dr. Richardson, WIC is, is an important um, um, program for, um, for women and, and folks um, who are pregnant and have small children. The SNAP program is the Supplement Nutrition Assistance Program. That's what folks used to call uh, food stamps. Um, and that is the program that allows, uh, you know, for folks to um, get some assistance covering the cost of their groceries. I think that there are, in my personal opinion, not enough places where folks can utilize those SNAP benefits. Um, and so that could be something we look at is, is increasing the availability of, um, of places where folks can utilize their, their SNAP benefits. Uh, we were looking in, um, in parts of the Tri-County where we see that, you know, SNAP utilization or, or people spending the time to register and sign up for that wonderful program, uh, rates are pretty low. And when we when we interviewed those folks and we talked uh, to folks, we found out that they weren't signing up because there weren't enough places for them to use it at. Um, so, um, you know, that's that's one thing that maybe we could look at. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that our the Charleston Farmers Market probably has some vendors um, that accept uh, SNAP EBT. Um, but uh, we could look and see if there are other opportunities to increase that access. All right, thank you. Anyone else? I mean, just to add, I think that add to what Jerry and, and, and Katie were saying as well, I think certainly a lot of being able to provide um, education or certainly some sharing information in terms of what what, what is the healthy food to purchase. Well. I think one of the problems that that are faced um, is that people are somewhat confined by what they can purchase in terms of what they can afford, because very often healthy food is obviously more expensive sometimes as well. Um, so uh, being able to provide um, some clarity and some information around um, choices that people can make around healthy food as well. I mean, what is what is what is in what is in in what would be considered a healthy food in terms of pseudo, sodium, sugar content, etc. Um, and we've certainly got a lot of materials on that, but being able to provide that information, making that available, I think is, is something that could be helpful as well. Very good. Yeah, it might just be a good opportunity. I mean, again, in our, our that little newsletter that we put out on a weekly basis, it's maybe a little nutritional tip on a regular basis and, and talking about SNAP and, and, and WIC and, and the food bank of just, Keeping in Low Country 211, keeping those those resources at the fingertips and CARTA, keeping those things at the fingertips of our community and, and using those educational tools 
a new new shot every so often just to remind people of what we have. We've got assets. We just need to to try to, to match them to the liabilities out there of where we, we have got the, the, um, the, the biggest needs. And um, maybe it's just the city becoming a little bit better communicator of, of, of what's available in our community through all the different resources we have from our neighborhoods to our businesses to our workforces to our public safety that, that we just give them the toolkits to do to, to be able to share that information. So. Well, Paul, it seems like a natural if any newsletter you send out, they at least put a link to public transit to ridecarta.com and we can highlight, you know, monthly, weekly, however you want to do it, different programs that we've got going on that would be of interest to people, not to overwhelm them, but just to keep educating them. I'll work on that this week with you. Great. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hey, this is Carolyn. I have a quick question. Um, I know there are restrictions as to what can be purchased or how the, the WIC benefit can be used. But is that also available to men or just women and children? Uh, my understanding is that it is women and children. Um, obviously, women are purchasing food and taking it home. And so um, it is um, being used uh, for the household, um, but it is it really started and continues to be a program to ensure that pregnant women are as healthy as possible um, and that um, children um, through mom's um, breastfeeding and, uh, and providing highly nutritious foods um, while they are young um, helps kids to get off to um, a good start. So I'll check that Carolyn, just make sure, um, but that's my understanding. Thank you very much, Katie. All right, very good. Well, uh, um, another, um, let's steal Kevin's thunder again and Katie's, but another um, element is that we wanted to make sure that that not only do we communicate all what we're doing in the city of, into our city um, family, but we are going to go for the June meeting and Mike will have to hold back on Carta maybe, but on the June meeting, we're gonna visit the, um, Katie's home up in North Charleston at the uh, the Teddy Pryor Social Service um, Hub and get a tour of all the, the different operations up there so that we'll be a little bit more educated over what's available. And, and Katie, I'll let you just tell us a tiny bit about that. Well, we're very excited since December. Um, we've been um, in the new Teddy Pryor Social Services Hub that's on um, Rivers Avenue. Um, the cross street is McMillan. It's across from the old Navy Hospital, um, which I think is the tallest building in North Charleston. So that seems to always be a good focal point for people to know where we are. Um, and when the county um, built this building uh, for us, it um, the county chose to include um, Day Otis, um, the Charleston Center moved from downtown um, into this uh, building, um, both for their um, medication treatment um, clinic, as well as uh, detox and residential treatment, um, outpatient um, groups um, and, um, and treatment. Uh, DSS um, is located um, here as well. Um, sort of all the services that they provide um, for the county. Um, Medicaid is here. That's actually um, DHHS. Um, and um, I am forgetting, I feel like someone, maybe not. Um, may, oh, Department of Mental Health. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Um, has, uh, has also um, an inpatient, um, remind me the name, Stacy. It's the Tri-County Crisis Stabilization Center. It's a voluntary unit for folks in some sort of psychiatric distress. Yes, Jennifer actually gave me um, a tour and um, it's an amazing resource um, to really try to keep folks um, both out of our county detention center and out of the um, emer emergency departments um, when that's not really the level of care um, or where they need to be, um, but that they do need some help um, getting back um, on their feet and back on track. Uh, and so we... Um, 
I've reserved a conference room here. I hope that um, all of you will make the effort to uh, to come up. There's plenty of parking. Um, you will need to go through um, security um, when you uh, arrive. So um, come a couple of minutes before, uh, and um, and Paul will send out um, further directions. But we're on the second floor um, of that building. And, but it is a learning experience, uh, just learning what Charleston, uh, hopefully we can learn what Charleston Center does and, and the different resources that are available in our community. Um, they're just sitting right there and we just need to drive traffic toward all of them. So um, it's a, a great opportunity. All right. Thank you. Very good. Um, well, um, yeah, I'll be... Um, Great, great meeting. I appreciate everybody's time and and um, and all of your comments and, and everything you shared. It was a very good meeting, a lot of great information. And um, Paul and I, and of course, Councilman Seekings as well, will be reporting out to city council, as we said, and hopefully we can see what the city can do to tie into what you know, MUSC, Roper St. Francis, United Way, FEDER, Mental Health Department, everybody has done. Hopefully the city can find ways to tie in and, and see what we can do better to um, to push that needle forward on, on life expectancy. And I also look forward to seeing everybody in person. It, it's June 7th. Is that right, Paul? Is that, I think that's right. June, June 7th, we get to see each other in person at the new social services hub and I uh, look forward to touring that. Um, is there anything else to come before this committee? I just wanted to put in one final plug when, when we were back on the needs assessment and the clinical preventive services. And I think it's along the same lines of what we've already been talking about, but we do have, we've definitely seen a drop off in, um, in the public um, utilizing preventive services during the COVID pandemic. Just again, having difficulty getting in, but um, now um, many are behind on their colonoscopies, their vaccinations. Uh, their mammograms, um, those sorts of services. And, and we do have a number of um, great programs, um, including um, mobile vans um, that are able to travel around, um, set up in um, parking lots or businesses, that sort of thing to help provide um, at least those uh, mammograms and, um, and pap smears. Um, we could certainly highlight the, uh, the need for the vaccinations um, as well as, um, and I'm sure there are options for colonoscopies as well, but I don't know those off the top of my head. So again, I think utilizing the, the newsletter and the uh, sort of bully pulpit that the city has uh, for getting out information on um, all of these opportunities um, to get caught up on preventive clinical preventive services um, would be a great way for the for the city to help to um, address um, some of these disparities. Very good. Yeah. We'll do. And I would Joey. add that I would add that, you know, if the city is involved in a community wide event or some um, gathering, uh, you know, reach out to this committee and I'm sure that we can find lots of great partners who could come to those events and we could park a mobile van or we could bring out someone to do vaccinations um, or do some, some preventive screening. So um, yeah, I think there's lots of ways that we can connect with what's already going on and just try to consider health in all of the various aspects that the city is involved in. Okay. Very good, Joey. We'll do that. Absolutely. All right. Anything else? Well, again, thank you so much for spending your time and, uh, and, and sharing what we needed to hear. And, um, you know, I, I really appreciate all the expertise we have. And I, I really appreciate that the majority of us want to continue to stay on here, as Paul's asked, um, if, if you would want to roll off or stay on. I'm very excited that most of you want to stay because uh, you're very valuable to, to, to what we're doing here. So thank you so much. If there's nothing else to uh, come before the committee, then we stand adjourned. So. Kevin, Kevin, I'd like to add oh, something real quick, yeah, and this Carol. is of no real significance other than to my family, but um, my niece, who's a student at St. Andrews School of Math and Charter, had an opportunity to participate in the career day last week and spent the day with Mayor Tecklenburg and helped with the groundbreaking at the Old Town Creek Park. So her oh, picture great. is in the West Ashley paper, and I consider that um, an indication of what will happen 
someday she becomes Charleston's first African American mayor. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Awesome. <laughs> Very good. I hope so. All right. Well, um, if there's nothing else, um, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.